Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us virtually. My name is Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Marketing at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a Living Memorial to the Holocaust. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the second annual New York Jewish Book Festival. This Our talk this evening is on the book Middle East Maze, Israel, the Arabs, and the Region. This special book is on sale through Brookings and at the museum. Uh, I'll put those links in the chat for you. I'll hope you buy the book. Um, just for some logistics, closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn those on are posted in the chat. Uh, if you have questions for our speakers during the program, please do put them into the Q&A function specifically. Um, it just helps me to keep track of the questions and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the hour. Um, so we at the museum are proud to offer events and bring speakers together to share the many perspectives and expert opinions that reflect our diverse museum community. Here we're honored that Itamar Rabinovich and Tom Friedman will share theirs. Itamar is a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, a professor and president emeritus at Tel Aviv University. He served as Israel's ambassador to the United States and chief negotiator with Syria. He is also the chair of the Dan David Foundation. His previous book with Carmit Valencia is Syrian Requiem from Princeton in 2021. Thomas Friedman is an American political commentator and author. He's a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner who is a weekly columnist for the New York Times. He has written extensively on foreign affairs, global trade, the Middle East, globalization, and environmental issues. So I will be here in the chat for all of you and I'll come back for the Q&A, but I will hand the, the afternoon over to you, Tom and Itamar. Thanks so much. Well, Ariel, thanks so much, um, Itamar. It's great to be with you um, uh, for your the uh, knowledge of your audience. This is a 40-year friendship, and um, uh, I'm just so pleased to be able to be here to um, engage Itamar uh, on his new book, Middle Eastern Maze. Um, uh, I don't believe in free speech to all of you in the audience, so um, your one requirement is to go uh, click and buy this book uh, immediately. And uh, for the next 45 minutes, Itamar um, uh, and I will show you why. So um, uh, just for starters, uh, Itamar, because I know everyone's super glued to the news, before we get to the book, would you just take a, a couple minutes and give us your update on how you see the situation now um, uh, in Gaza, um, in Israeli politics, uh, and, and the Israeli military operation? Yeah, we are in, in an intermediate point. It's been a very long war. It's six weeks now. Remember that a very significant part of the Israeli population is mobilized by reserve service, that we have 120,000 refugees from the south and, uh, and the north. Um, and we have a, a government that uh, is besieged politically uh, by, uh, uh, by the public. And the realization, uh, a dual realization, one is that the hostage issue has shifted to the front. Uh, it more and more important to the Israeli public that uh, as many hostages as, as we can be brought back. Just today we found out that uh, one of them who either died or was murdered, uh, her body was found by uh, in the famous or infamous uh, Shifa, uh, Shifa hospital. So the war aims now are, are to the, the defeat or unseat Hamas as a military and political force and to bring back the hostages or most of the hostages. Um, I think that there's a more modest view of, uh, of the first. I think that the, the uh, sort of, uh, high rhetoric of the first few days of the war, um, I think have, have been moderated. The leadership, political and military realizes that it's, it will take a very long haul to do that. And many more casualties and I think Israel doesn't have the time. Uh, political clocks are ticking, and we'll have to settle on on less than uh, less than that. Um, uh, I think we know now that uh, Iran doesn't want Hezbollah to join the war in uh, uh, in the north. And although 
definitely they are many, uh, running a very dangerous game of uh, provoking us al along the uh, along the border and uh, I think we probably have limited uh, limited time a couple of weeks few weeks uh, when the war will come to an end uh, Israel will then have to do its own soul searching and reckoning, political reckoning at home. And the real uh, task of uh, uh, dealing with uh, Gaza itself, who is to administer and uh, Gaza, how it fits into the larger Palestinian question, how it fits into the politics of the region, and into the international politics. They are all, uh, they are all layers uh, that we have to deal with. Well, that's very helpful. And we'll come back to that a little later. And if folks have questions, please um, uh, put them in the chat and, and Ariel will um, uh, you know, pick out um, some as we go along. Um, speaking of layers, uh, Itamar, your book is really um, uh, a set of layers uh, going back to your time as a diplomat in Washington and then um, uh, the Syrian negotiations up through you know, Camp David and the others. Talk about how you constructed this book and why you built it this way? And I, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm professionally, I'm a historian. Historians normally tell a story. And there's always a tension, as, as I think you know from, from your own uh, several books, uh, between the narrative and the analysis. When you want to tell a story, but you also want to offer an analysis. So how do you combine the two? What I did in this book, is I separated the two. I have a narrative, and, and then I have two analytical chapters. One is a web of relationships, uh, which looks at Israel's relationship with every actor in the region. And the second is, is called peace and normalization, and looks at the question of how Arabs and Israelis look at these very important notions of peace and normalization. So it's a book that uh, one can use as a reference book, as a textbook, or uh, uh, read or read the parts of it if you really want to know uh, what happened at Camp David II, why it failed, or what did Olmert put on the table that Mahmoud Abbas uh, didn't pick up, you can find it there. So um, I'd like to start there because one of the things I found fascinating is these kind of multiple perspectives you have on Camp David II, which now looking back, Itamar, we sort of never really recovered from. So I'd like you to talk about two things. Why was Camp David II and the failure of Camp David II so important? And bring us into the, the historian's debate about what happened then and who was at fault. Yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, I, uh, I discovered four, I, I dis described in the book four different interpretations of what happened at, at Camp David II. What I call the Orthodox school, that was Bill Clinton and uh, Ehud Barak and Dennis Ross. So I say, well, Arafat is, is to blame. Uh, Ehud, Ehud Barak really went a long way. I never used the term made a generous offer. You know, it's a question, not a question of generosity, but made a very far-reaching offer, broke many taboos. And Arafat was not interested in making the deal at that time. So that's the Orthodox. Then there is. Stop, the... stop, can you stop you there? Because that that sure. goes through. Why wouldn't Arafat have been interested in making a deal at that time that would have given Palestinians, I don't know, 80, 85, 90, 92, I don't know what the exact number is, uh, percent of, of uh, the West Bank uh, and Gaza with swaps and whatnot? Why wouldn't because he, not... he didn't? Because Arafat was, did not want to offer finality. I think the thing that Israelis want the most uh, is to know that this is finality, that uh, this is it, we accept one another, no more claims, and uh, finality. This is uh, the deepest quest that Israelis have, and this is what Arafat did not want to give. And when he was put to the test, uh, he, he chose to go home. So anyway, that's the orthodox. Now, there was the uh, <clears throat> revisionist school made famous by uh, Rob Malio, eventually uh, became the U.S. negotiator with Iran and 
a Lebanese a Shia called Hussein Ha, a very interesting man, a, a very close to Abu Mazen. They challenged it in a famous uh, article published in the New York Review of Books, and then put on the front page of your paper, the New York Times, arguing that, no, it's Barak who was to blame, uh, not not Arafat, so that's the revisionist school. And what was the essence of their argument? Why was it Barak? Well, he said because uh, he said actually the Palestinians should have made no uh, no concessions because the, the, he, even if they, if they accept the borders of sixty seven, then they accept a very small fraction of historic Palestine, and that's it. They shouldn't make more concessions and. And um, Barak did not treat Arafat well, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. That's the revisionist uh, uh, school. There is now a deterministic school that argues it, it was meant to fail. It, was, it could never succeed because uh, Oslo was a mistake. Oslo couldn't work. And this is the point at which Oslo exploded. And finally, an eclectic school that takes elements from uh, and the, the three schools and put them together. So uh, it, it was a very uh, milestone event and uh, not surprisingly, there are many approaches and, uh, and interpretations, but uh, that, that was a, indeed a milestone event. I want to double click on Arafat again. Um, why was he unwilling, I mean, I have my ideas, but I want to hear you articulate it, to actually make a finality of claims um, uh, and if he wasn't able and willing to do that, could we ever expect any Palestinian leader to do that? And, um, you know, at the, at the time in the nineties, when I, when I was a diplomat in Washington and a peace negotiator with uh, Syria and people asked me, what is the problem with the peace process? And I said, unfortunately, Assad is no Sadat and Arafat is no Mandela. Mm -hmm. Um, we, um, what, what happens uh, when, you know, very bitter national conflicts come to an end, you know, be it in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, be it in uh, uh, South Africa, uh, until a couple of years ago, I would have said in Eastern Europe, but uh, that apple cart was upset yeah. by, <laughs> by, by Vladimir Putin. Uh, it, 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 there has to be a, a, an unusual encounter between two leaders who are, who are willing to uh, make the sacrifices, maybe sometimes even go, go against the grain of uh, their career and position for, for many years. And when, when these such two leaders uh, meet, yeah. uh, you have that uh, breakthrough. Sometimes, you know, people pay for their lives that uh, Rabin did, Michael, Michael Collins did in, in Ireland that uh, many, many years. Uh, earlier. Now, we have not had that moment. Uh, uh, you had Rabin, you had Shimon Peres, and Arafat, and later um, Mahmoud Abbas did not rise to the occasion, unfortunately. So, hopefully somewhere, somewhere, uh, when we have a change of leadership among the Palestinians a few years down the road, uh, a Palestinian Mandela will show up. How has that Camp David failure, though, Itamar, and how do you discuss this in the book, how has it really been an overhang, um, a ball and chain, really on the on the peace process and, and Israeli-Palestinian relations ever since? Um, because it uh, it was seen uh, as a moment of truth and. Uh, uh, Ehud Barak said we have no partner and, and became then the anathema of the Israeli left for, for saying that, paid dearly uh, uh, in terms of his own uh, political standing in the country because the left would never forgive him uh, for, uh, for saying that. Uh, but actually, it should not have ended there because I, after, after that, um, you know, Ehud Olmert put, put yeah. on the table something even more far-reaching and uh, Mahmoud Abbas did not take it, did not pick it up. He, um, maybe he just couldn't do it. You know, he, at the end of the day, he's, he's a refugee from uh, Safad and maybe he doesn't see himself as somebody who would give up the, the Palestinian quest for, for return. 
also it was at the very end of uh, Olmet's term, he was going home, and there were those who were telling uh, Mahmoud Abbas, don't make a deal with somebody who won't be there a few months down the road. In any event, he missed it. If you open Condoleezza Rice's uh, book, she describes how she was stunned by how far uh, Olmet was willing to go, and even more stunned by the fact that Mahmoud Abbas did not grab it. It does sober you um, uh, about the prospects for any kind of peace agreement coming out of the, this Israel-Hamas war, which has been much more interpersonally, you know, venomous, and um, and has left sort of no Palestinian leader standing um, uh, with any um, you know ability to make any large decisions. I, you know, the one, the one development that can take place is that uh, I think it's universally agreed that uh, the Palestinian Authority should be brought back to Gaza from whence it was expelled by Hamas in 2007. And it would be a great opportunity for them to, to persuade the world and Israeli public opinion or political system most that they can do the job. Uh, it, it would it would be it's it would be a, it will be a very important test for them. And could be a turning point. I know. I agree. I, I um, in my own conversations in Ramallah with people in the PA and and sort of a new generation of of Palestinians from Fatah, um, you know, my message was for for a complex set of reasons, history has given the PA a, a real second chance. That in some ways everybody needs a much more effective Palestinian authority. Some Israeli government, maybe not the current one, is going to need a Palestinian partner to help manage Gaza uh, and and the West Bank, America, the Europeans, everyone's going to want one. So this is a time to really try to get your own house in order to take advantage mm -hmm. of this moment. It it may be the last train. I mean, when you do check the train schedules, there is such a thing as the last train, and right. um, uh, this may be the one. And um, but it's a I think it does offer a great opportunity if if. Um, uh, the Palestinian leadership in 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 the West Bank and whatever comes out of Gaza, you know, can do that because I think there'll also be a lot of interest in Arab countries to to help uh, build the coherence uh, of a non-corrupt you know PA if we can find the leader if they can agree on a leader you know um, so it's something I'm, I'm thinking about yeah you know I I in reading the book Itamar you know it's um because of everything that's happened in Syria. Uh, the the Syrian civil war and the breaking of the country and um, uh, what was that term you had the, the essential Syria that's what um, uh, Bashar Assad now governs you know um, uh, I forgot there was a really serious Israeli Syrian peace process that you were at the center of talk about what happened there how close did it ever get and why did it fail um. It, uh, you know, I think Assad came, uh, Assad came to uh, to Madrid and came to the peace process as somebody who who bought a ticket to a train that says destination peace. But he figured out that he could get off the train at any given station. He, and again, I at the time when people asked me about the difficulty of that negotiation, I would say that's a negotiation between a reluctant partner. And uh, uh, um, an ambivalent partner. Uh, Rabin was ambivalent, and Assad was reluctant. This takes us to the very key role of the United States yes. um, as uh, the party that should bring them together. Now, personally, I'm not a great fan of Jimmy Carter, but I take my hat off for him for making Kim David one work because he, he had. He was a bit of a missionary, and he knew how to be manipulative. And he, without him, it would not have happened. And sometimes I ask myself, maybe we could have used him in, in Camp David too, uh, to, to break heads together, to manipulate. And you know, think that Bill Clinton was too nice a person to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I in Bear to do some, I talked about some of the ideal peacemaker, and you got to really combine the sort of grocer and SOB, you know, I mean, uh, you know, right. someone who can haggle, but also um, 
someone uh, like a Jim Baker who can put your hand on the table, take a hammer and smash every bone in your hand to get your attention. I never felt that Warren Christopher um, just, he, he just never felt like the right guy to do that. Well, unfortunately, you know, I'm, if you ask me what is the most dramatic moment in, in your life, uh, I would say that was the moment in which Yitzhak Rabin gave Warren Christopher what is known as the deposit. Yeah. This uh, conditional hypothetical willingness to withdraw from the Golan in, uh, in return for a peace uh, agreement with, uh, with Israel, uh, like the Egyptian peace agreement. And there were four persons in the room, as uh, uh, Christopher, Rabin, Dennis Ross, and, and myself as the note takers. And uh, when we stepped out of the room, I said to Dennis, you know, uh, I, I could really sense sort of history in the room. Mm. And Rabin said to Christopher several times in the meeting, he said, this deposit is in your pocket. It must not be on the table. And when Christopher came back to Jerusalem and, and he said, I have good news, uh, Assad agrees in principle, but he has, you know, 17 conditions and so forth and so forth, it became evident that he put it on the table. Hmm. And at that moment, Rabbi knew that all was lost and yeah. he decided to go to Oslo. Hmm. This uh, Rabbi was not enamored of Oslo and he would have yeah. preferred the Syrian thing. Yeah. Ichmar, what is it all, though? Um make you feel um you've seen the syrian one super close up you've lived the palestinian one um uh you grew up with the egyptian one is anything possible i'm asking myself that uh, i think i mean we, we also have the abraham accords yes uh, and we'll talk about that I, in a second yeah <laughs> so you know the, I think the Abraham Accords uh, were matched inside Israel by the fact that uh, a great, great uh, Arab-Israeli political leader, Mansour Abbas, joined the government coalition. And basically what he and the Emiratis were saying was the same. He said, we've given more than 70 years to the Palestinian questions. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. The Palestinians are not doing what they need to do in order to, to get there. So we need to look after our own affairs. I mean, there's plenty to look after if you are in a rich, small Arab state in the Gulf, or if you are one of two million Israeli Arab citizens. Yes, can I stop? And, I never thought of that. Either. It's the confluence of both, one from the outside, one from above and one from below. You know, exactly. and Israelis are saying, let's look inside. Exactly. That's interesting. Exactly. So... Um, this is happening. The, uh, the fact that the fatigue that a large part of the Arab world feels, the priority that they assign to, to other issues, but of course, the, the Palestinian issue will not go away. Yeah. And the, the big mistake of uh, the right-wing Israeli governments of the past years was to think that they could walk past the Palestinian uh, issue, and that exploded in our face on October 7th. Um, talk more about the Abraham Accords, um, how they came about. What what should we, what should we take from them? Because uh, you said um, uh, they really came about because the core Kushner Trump plan vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians failed. Um, talk about that dynamic. Right. It uh, it was actually an unintended consequence. Of, uh, of the Trump quest to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I mean, uh, Trump, uh, Trump really wanted to, to be uh, the deal maker who would make that. This is the ultimate deal. This is the deal that gets you the Nobel Prize. But they gave it to Obama before he actually began his presidency. And I, Donald Trump, I also must have a Nobel mm -hmm. Prize. And this is the place to get it. So he really wanted to be the deal maker in that regard. He put together an unusual group of uh, three American Jews, two of them very right wing, uh, one of them a big supporter of uh, Ambassador Friedman, a big supporter of no relations, I guess. No relationship, as they say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a big supporter of, of the settlers, very unlikely team. And they put together a peace plan that was not acceptable to, to the Arabs, but it it had two elements 
that Netanyahu and the Israeli right wing did not like, namely a Palestinian state and a territorial swap. He did have these two, uh, these two elements. And uh, the Israeli right wing wanted uh, pressure Netanyahu to annex uh, part of, of the West Bank. And that actually gave the Emiratis a trump card. Oh, they could now make a deal with Israel if Israel undertook not to annex anything. That could legitimize what, uh, what they wanted to do. And this is how it happened. So when Trump launched his uh, uh, peace plan, that's not what he had in mind. But of course, the opportunity was there to make another deal. And he actually used American assets to make that happen in uh, what he gave to Morocco, what he offered to, uh, to Sudan and so forth. He used American assets and that became the biggest, maybe the only foreign policy achievement of his uh, uh, presidency. Itamar, what do you see as the prospects for that now being widened to a Saudi-Israeli deal? Um, obviously with a different Israeli government, which is pretty certainly in our offing. Um, do you think that deal has, can survive this war? Um, how do you see the Saudis making the calculation right now? It, it can survive the war. The fact is that the countries that signed the, uh, the Abraham Accords have not uh, gone back. Uh, the, the peace and normalization with them is still on. Uh, the Saudis uh, uh, indicated very clearly that they are still in the game. They, they want the American deal and they want the Israeli deal because they all understand that the big game in the region is the Russian Chinese effort through Iran to unseat the United States. Uh, I think the idea uh, raised during the Obama years of pivoting away from the Middle East was a bad idea. Uh, somebody said, if you do not visit the Middle East, the Middle East visits you. Uh, it's just an area of the world that you cannot abandon. The vacuum will not remain uh, uh, empty for uh, for whatever. And the US, I think the, the, the Biden quest uh, to make the deal with Saudi Arabia indicates that uh, this is what he wants to do. He also wanted to, uh, or came to understand that he needs is, uh, Israeli support in order to get the deal through Congress and the Israeli element was was added. The Saudis like it. And I think in the years to come, in order to, uh, to, to face successfully this Iranian, Russian and growing Chinese challenge, the, the group of pro-American uh, countries in the region will have to be organized into an effective Coalition right now it's it's a group of states that uh, are not very very coherent, and this goes well beyond uh, the end of the election season in in the states. Whoever is the president of the United States in the coming years will have to invest a great effort in putting that grouping grouping together. Now Israel would be a desirable member in this club, but it will have to move forward on the Palestinian issue. Not a two-state solution tomorrow morning. That's right. not in the cards for tomorrow morning. But there's plenty between the status quo and a two-state solution. Do you think, um, I saw Benny Gantz when I was in Israel and I uh, was off the record, um, uh, so I, I, I won't um, violate that, but do you see him as the most likely successor um, to Netanyahu right now? Um, and do you see a coalition he would put together as capable of moving down the road toward more and more Palestinian self-rule subject to Israel's security needs and requirements? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in your sense of how far you think uh, he, with a kind of center-right, largely coalition, can go. Yeah. So... Uh, interesting, first of all, procedural question. How do you, how does one replace the current, the, the, the current yeah. government? There are two legal ways. One is to, to vote no confidence and to have an election a hundred years down, a hundred days down the road. That's a very long time. I don't think the public wants to see yes. such a long uh, transitional period. The second is to, to, to build what we call a, a constructive no confidence in which you present 
an alternative coalition. There may be a rebellion inside uh, Netanyahu's own party. And at least for the short period until the elections, there may be a, a prime minister from, uh, from the Likud in a coalition right. government whose task would be to prepare to the next election. Yeah. If you accept the, the numbers of the public opinion polls released today by one of the Israeli channels, Benny Gantz has a huge lead. He's uh, 36 out of 120 members of Knesset. Netanyahu is 17. The, the current opposition, the huge advantage over the, the coalition, and it could form its own, uh, its own government quite, uh, quite easily. Of course, 100 days uh, from now is a, long, uh, is a long time. Many things will happen. I never underestimate Netanyahu's abilities as a politician. Um, and there is, he also has a base. The base is not going away. Um, so the, today's numbers may not be the, the numbers in when election day takes place. Of course, Benny Gantz wants, wants an election because he will, he will then be the, the, the great winner. Others don't necessarily want an election. So making, uh, uh, making an omelette out of these many eggs is going to be a, a complex uh, challenge. Um, before we go to some questions from the audience, um, Itamar, I want to go back to where we started, um, which is talking about the current situation. Um, and for our listeners who don't know, you know, Gaza is basically divided into sort of three parts. There's northern Gaza, which is Gaza City, up to the Gaza River. There's a central part, which is the biggest refugee camps. And now up to a million, I don't know how many refugees from Gaza City you know, a living in, in temporary shelter. And then you have Han Yunus and the South, um, where I think it's widely accepted, the leadership, the Hamas leadership, Yahya Sinwar um, and uh, Mohammed Deif are probably uh, hiding. Um, freezing the war here strikes me as like really complicated um, for Israel. You know, you're you're occupying Gaza City. It's, it's largely rubble. You've got a huge refugee population to your south, and then you want to be able to go on in some way, attack, um, uh, find, capture, kill the Hamas leadership. That's a really, really complicated, complex situation that is, doesn't strike me as long-term sustainable. Um, and so I just want you to talk about that, how you see it. Yeah, it is uh, It is going to be uh, long-term. The, uh, the idea would be uh, uh, not to repeat the invasion of uh, uh, that, that was carried out in Gaza itself, in the northern part, in the south, but yes. be on, on the external perimeter and carry out occasional raids and so forth and so forth. I don't know how tenable it is yeah. for months to come. Uh, there have to be a more modest, I think, definition uh, in order to, uh, to, bring the war to, uh, to bring the war to an end. Of course, uh, Netanyahu has an interest in perpetuating uh, or extending the war because uh, quote unquote you don't you don't change leadership in the middle of the war I'm not sure that this is uh, uh, this is going to work yeah it was striking listening to President Biden last night um you know how forceful he was and saying there shouldn't be a ceasefire until uh you know Hamas's leadership has been um you know uh dismantled um and I was thinking as I was listening to me tomorrow that I wonder if some of that isn't just sort of being sympathetic to Israel's case and security requirements. I wonder if he also isn't hearing from a lot of our Arab allies uh, who are never going to say this publicly, uh, but uh, have no desire to see Hamas, in, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood of Gaza, uh, which is opposed by Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, uh, you know, a, a, and the like, emerging in any way intact from this war. Exactly. And I think that uh, when when President Biden dispatched the, uh, the two carrier forces and a nuclear submarine to, to the region, it was, uh, of course, meant to, uh, uh, to reinforce Israel at a, at a very difficult moment, but it was also a message to the, uh, to the allies in the Gulf. He said, we, we do stand by our friends. It's something they, they worry about. And, you know, you you spent a few years in Beirut. You know you know the, the this part the Levant very very well, and 
I know you you know the Gulf pretty well as well. I think what has happened in the Arab world in, in the last couple of decades is that the accent has shifted to the Gulf, not just because the money is there. More and more of the intellectual and cultural life, the political cloud, these are countries that know and now become very sophisticated in, in using the cloud. And uh, other countries, I mean, Syria is, uh, is a failed state, Iraq is a failed state, Egypt is not a failed state, but it is encumbered by, by yeah. huge problems. And these are thriving, uh, these are thriving countries. And they are very important allies for the United States. Yeah, I think they're part of a broader shift, you know, where, as I've seen in my, so I started in, in Beirut in, in, um, in 79, um, a shift to from Arab leaders who built their legitimacy with their people on the basis of resistance, you know, stick with me, uh, I will resist the Yehudis, I will resist the Americans, I will resist the Sunnis, I'll resist the Shia, uh, et, et cetera, to a whole new generation, generation of leaders building their legitimacy on resilience, their ability to provide their people with educational resilience, even climate resilience, you know, economic resilience, jobs. And that shift is really happening. It's really the struggle between Iran uh, and MBS right now. You see right. it in, in, in its most stark. So exactly. um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by that. Errol, I want to ask you to jump in uh, for a second, if you would. We've got a, a little more time for some questions uh, for Itamar. Great, wonderful. Thank you both so much for this conversation. Um, I'm just gonna go in order of the questions that we've received because I think they're all pretty good. So um, Jim wants to know, are there specific steps that American Jews can take um, to prevent Netanyahu and the ultra right-wingers from hijacking any possibility of peace? Um, I. I tell you what worries me. What worries me is that uh, before before our life was taken hostage by October seven, we we spent almost a year uh, fighting to defend Israeli democracy uh, against what was known as the uh, judicial reform. Uh, the 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 mind, the brain that planned this was called the Kohelet Forum. The Kohelet Forum is funded by conservative American Jews. And what what I hope is that no Jewish money from the United States will go in into organizations that want to undermine Israeli democracy. Really important message. It's a really, really important message. Thanks. Sure. Um, Tony asks, wouldn't the hostages be freed immediately if Israel would declare a ceasefire? I'm afraid not. You see, we're, we're, dealing, uh, we're dealing with a very sophisticated, brutal, cruel uh, uh, group, bunch, uh, Yahya Sinwar and, and company, and, and they know how to play their cards. So they know how sensitive... You remember, they had one Israeli soldier called Gilad Shalit, for several years, and eventually they managed to have a deal where he, whereby 1,000 uh, Hamas prisoners were released, including Yahya Sinwar himself from Israeli prison for one soldier. Now they have 240 hostages, or maybe less, but more than 200, I hope. Uh, they are going to play that card to the end, and. They will uh, try to meet it out. They will uh, cheat. They will uh, say, okay, 50 hostages for this and that. And then after 20, they say, oh, no, there's a problem. They'll try to drag it out for as long as they can. It's, it's going to be a nightmare of a negotiation. And remember hostages. Remember, Jimmy Carter finally <laughs> lost the election pretty much because of the uh, hostage issue in, in Iran, the humiliation that America went through because of uh, a much smaller number of hostages. It's a huge issue. Go ahead, Eric. Sure. Lee, um, Lee requests uh, that both of you comment about the prospect for Marwan Barghouti to be able to run and or be appointed to run Gaza slash the PA after the end of the war. Itamar, go ahead. Yeah, 
to run Gaza. Bar- explain who Barghouti is. Yeah, Barghouti is uh, he, he's, he's a Fatah leader who was involved in the uh, Second Intifada. He's actually uh, directly responsible for murdering quite a few uh, Israelis. He has been in Israeli jail. And there is a school of thought that argues that he is, he would be the Palestinian Mandela, he would be the Palestinian Benbella, uh, he would be released from prison and become the national leader. Uh, I personally don't know him. And I, some of my friends who are experts on the Palestinian politics claim that he is much overrated. Um, there's, there's going to, uh, you know, and no, no Palestinian leader would be uh, legitimate if he is appointed from the outside by Israel or by the United States. It would have to emerge uh, from within. There would be no legitimacy otherwise. It's not just the Americans and the Israelis who are playing in the game. Uh, s- some of the Emiratis have their, uh, their own Palestinians, quote unquote, uh, living uh, among them, financed by them. And there would be a very messy struggle for succession when the day comes. But not in Gaza. I mean, that's about being the leader of the PA. Yeah, I would, I would have nothing to add to that. I, I know Barghouti a little. I've covered him uh, before he uh, went to went to prison. Um, you will have a, a Palestinian leader, though, who will have um, almost surely uh, gone through the uh, Israeli Ulpan system um, uh, in the Israeli prison system. Uh, you almost need that bona fide. Um, but you will have one who will speak very good Hebrew um, when the time comes to negotiate. Thanks. Um, I know that you mentioned this a little bit about um, Biden's proposal for the two-state solution. Uh, Howard wants to know, with U.S. support, is this more of a possibility? I, I think ultimately, ultimately, it's 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 a possibility, uh, even a likelihood. But ultimately, it's a, the, the terms are not are not there now. It's not ripe for this now. And let me also mention uh, a very important uh, current of thought or belief among many young Palestinians. Uh, Tom mentioned before that, that he met some of the younger father leaders. Some, some of them actually uh, are not really interested in two-state solutions, said it uh, will end up with a statelet, not with a real uh, state. And why not keep the status quo as it is? We live in one state with the Israelis. Uh, in time, the numbers will speak, will become a majority, and one man, one vote. Uh, we are people with patience. We can wait. So, uh, you know, let's uh, keep the status quo, and at the end of the day, uh, we would be the winners. So you have that uh, train of thought, which is, is, in a very strange way, brings together some of the most radical Israeli right-wing politicians who want a one-state uh, one state and one of the, some of the Palestinians want one state. But personally, I don't call it a one state solution because it's not a solution. I mean, I think separation is the key element here. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. There's not a lot, lot not a great record in the region of people living um, uh, in one state um, in Syria or Lebanon or whatever um, without um, uh, uh, some sense of order. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. Sure. Um, our next question, I think, comes from Myla. Um, why do you think that Iran and others are not opening up the current war on other fronts? Uh, well, Iran opens the the current war on whatever front it can. I mean, you have, of course, in Gaza, both uh, uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Uh, are not proxies, but they are very close allies of Iran. They have been supplied, trained, and financed by Iran. They would not have been able to build a, a military force and to launch this war without Iran. Of course, Hezbollah in Lebanon is an Iranian proxy. The Houthis in Yemen are. And then there are the Shia militias in Iraq. And, uh, and of course, there are all the, the Shia militias in Syria and uh, direct Iranian uh, presence. So they are on, in a way, on five fronts. They cannot activate 
the Iraqi front and there's a very limited activity from, from Syria. But on uh, three fronts, Gaza, Lebanon, and the Houthis, uh, it's active. And of course, uh, the supreme leader of, uh, of Iran was uh, very, very open and in a way cynical about it. He said, well, we're not going to sacrifice Iranians in this struggle. Uh, they are willing to fight to the last Lebanese and Palestinian, but they want to keep the, they don't like to see body bags either. Next, Daryl. Thanks so much. Um, Lauren asks, moving forward, what is a practical way to create conditions for a more moderate government in Israel? Uh, an election. Uh, you know, this is what uh, you know. It's, this is what what you have to do in democracies. I mean, uh, the uh, this this government and coalition failed failed miserably. Uh, the election, you, you know, in Britain they have uh, the mother of all democracies. They have this snap election, which I think is a very good thing. You know, we don't have a snap election. You need to wait a hundred days for an election, and that's a that's a very long time. But there, uh, there's no better way of uh, testing uh, the public will and uh, building a, a new and stable government uh, than uh, a free parliamentary election. Itamar, let me take you back to um, when we met first. It was, um, uh, I believe, 1977. I was a graduate student at St. Anthony's um, uh, studying with uh, Albert Hurani and the Modern Middle East Studies Program and Roger Owen, who you both knew you knew. And I was invited by you at the Dion Center to take part in a seminar uh, you had at the Dion Center. I even brought my mom from Minnesota, uh, came with me. And uh, I was in my second year of my master's degree. Um, would you recommend to young people watching the show now as someone, you know, reading your books and someone who's steeped both in the academic side and in the diplomacy, which is, I think, what makes your books so strong, to study Middle East studies today? Yes, Middle, Middle East studies, uh, history, humanities, social sciences, um, I still live in the academic world, and I, I watch uh, with worry uh, the the escape from the humanities. Uh, people want uh, practical professions, law, accounting, uh, computer engineering, and the the humanities are in decline. And uh, I think humanity depends on the humanities. Uh, so we we need students, not not just. Middle Eastern studies. I mean, uh, study any history, any uh, any politics. Remember, the British Empire was built on very solid grounds by people who studied classics in Oxford, mm -hmm. and they did pretty well. So, uh, yes, Middle, Middle Eastern studies or Middle Eastern history uh, is very important. I cannot tell you that it's more important or interesting than East Asian studies or or. Uh, uh, East European studies, it's you know, all area studies uh, are interesting. Of course, if you're an Israeli and live in Israel, Middle Eastern studies make more sense for you yeah. uh, than other studies. If you're an American, you could choose any part of uh, uh, any part of the world, but area studies in the sense that you combine a knowledge of history with one of the social sciences in order to understand the region that is of interest to you is a highly recommended field of study. Itamar, let me let me close with a um, um, last question. Um, President Biden calls you. Says, I just read Middle Eastern Maze. That's Middle Eastern Maze on Amazon.com, folks. I just read Middle Eastern Maze. Um, I learned a ton. But what should I do next? Uh, what uh, you should do next is, is build that Middle Eastern coalition of uh, moderate pro-Western states that are afraid of Iran, Russia, and China, and and want to trust that America is a dependable ally. The, uh, this is the most important thing you can do next. Sounds good, uh, Ariel. And if you have any other questions, um, uh, this has been just a lot of fun. Um, uh, Itamar, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, 
I learned a lot. So I don't really care about the other 180 uh, uh, participants. So it was, it was hugely worth my time. I'm really glad to be here. I want to urge everyone. Um, I said, I don't believe in free speech. Um, uh, you're, 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 the price of admission is to um, run, don't walk uh, to your computer and click on Middle Eastern Maze and Itamar Rabinovich, uh, buy this book. And um, Ariel, you know, thanks. This has been a great um, session with the Jewish Book Festival. Um, I, I wish you go from strength to strength. Um, I've got to run to meet my wife, but um, uh, I've just really enjoyed being here with everybody. And um, and thanks so much. Thank you so Thank much you. for doing this. Tom. Great to be with my you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, you Thank tomorrow. You, um, yes, thank you. And thanks to everyone who's who joined us this evening. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum at mjhnyc.org slash support. Um, and please check out our website to join us for the rest of the book festival, uh, to watch past programs.